from the Department of Languages. Dr. Smith has a PhD in German literature from the University of Hamburg. His research interests range from 18th and 19th century German literature and philosophy to German drama and music. He is a co-editor of the international Her 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 a biannual peer review professional journal of the International Herder Society. Dr. Schmidt has taught a variety of courses including German drama, 18th and 19th century German literature, the culture and literature of exile, seminars on World War II, as well as German language and culture courses at all levels. Please join me in welcoming, in welcoming Dr. Johann Schmidt. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, we can practice some, some German. Uh, <laughs> um, we want to thank you also for uh, inviting me back. Thank you, Victor. But thank you, everyone, uh, to uh, ask me to to come and um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about my research. Um, you mentioned that uh, I am the editor of the International Had a uh, Yearbook. So, but you know. Um, my English colleagues in our society also say herder, so you know, that's, that's, uh, that's completely uh, fine. Um, who of you have heard of Hada? You want to go free Hada? Okay. Uh, who has heard of Lessing? And this is not Doris Lessing, and they're not related. Okay, so <clears throat> I think um, this is, I'm proving my point. Uh, a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about um, Lessing. Uh, specifically, this is um, this is a reduced form of an article on Lessing uh, that is forthcoming in 18th century studies. Discussions about freedom in today's society rarely dive deeper into different forms of freedom. On the surface, it seems that we are mostly concerned with freedom of choice, and in our consumerism-oriented system, it means that we are presented with choices that, despite being abundant, force us to decide, to decide among the selection done by others. Nonetheless, it appears liberating that we are free to make our own decisions in our personal, professional, and political lives, of course, based on choices given to us <clears throat> by others to various degrees and based on factors that are beyond our control, not limited to gender race, but also to religious, sexual, and other predispositions. In all these public discussions, the question, what is freedom, is rarely raised, maybe because it appears to be an, uh, an impossible to answer. Hannah Arendt even points out that, quote, to raise the question itself seems to be a hopeless enterprise. She compares the question of freedom to realize the notion of a square circle. Aptly, she summarizes, quote, in all practical and especially political matters, we hold human freedom to be self-evident truth. And it is upon this axiomatic assumption that laws are laid down in human communities, that decisions are taken, that judgments are passed. But Adam also points out that in scientific and theoretical endeavors, the opposite view on human freedom is taken for granted, since in the last analysis, our lives are subject to causation, quote, and that if there should be an ultimately free ego in ourselves, in ourselves, it, it certainly never makes its unequivocal appearance in the phenomenal world, and therefore can never become the subject of theoretical assessments, end quote. Beginning in the 18th century, the question of freedom takes center stage. And it is particular German philosophy that seems obsessed with its associated problem, the problem of evil. From Leibniz to Heidegger, the line of illustrious philosophers seems endless. Yet, very few disputed the very notion of human free will, or at least seriously questions its existence. It is somewhat telling that those few writers have <clears throat> that those few writers that refute the idea of free will uh, <clears throat> have been for the most part ignored. Over there, for example. <clears throat> and moreover, are generally not considered serious philosophers. One such philosopher is Johann uh, Gottfried Lessing, <clears throat> uh, 
1729 to 1781. He is reported to have said, quote, I desire no free will, end of quote. For this, I will first outline the problem of freedom and the question of evil with a focus on the 18th century, particularly German Enlightenment. <clears throat> then I will follow up with an introduction of Lessing, since uh, apparently he's not a very familiar figure. I think this may be uh, good to, to talk a little bit about him in general terms. And then in order to uh, conclude with a discussion on his position on human free will. I'm convinced that Lessing's position while not providing a definite answer, is constructive for today's discussions. I hope that we may be able to address the implications of this position in our discussion afterward. During the Enlightenment, and even more so during the 19th century, the problem of freedom and evil emerged as a, que as a question that increasingly interested philosophers a great deal. Roughly, the general problem of freedom and evil can be summarized as follows. If God created the world and gave humans freedom, why would he allow for evil to arise? Did God will evil when he created the world? Or does evil spring from human freedom? The assumption that God did not will evil would call into question God's omnipotence. In other words, God's freedom would be limited. Either God willed human freedom and therefore had to allow for evil, or he did not will evil, and therefore freedom must exist outside of God. I know this is very, a very rough you know, summary. Um, Leibniz, in 1710, sets the tone by proposing that goodness is what, that which exists, whereas evil emerges from nothingness, or that which has no cause for being. After Leibniz, the existence of evil is rationalized as a necessary opposite for goodness, the absence that causes existence and goodness. Hegel may, be, may serve as an example, however obscure he may be in his argument. Hegel reevaluates the affiliation of evil and imperfection with negation. In his system, negation, or that which is nothing, becomes the positive dynamic driver of thought and action without, however, assuming any existence of its own. The negative, in fact, is the monstrous power that cannot be defined in any positive way other than by that which it thrusts into existence. With these all too brief and superficial remarks, I want to allude to the fact that German philosophy at this stage was effectively able to circumvent Spinoza's notion of nature as a lifeless machine and push God as a subject into the philosophical debate. In opposite to a theological and spiritual understanding, the essence of God became deeply rational. It also enabled Kant to introduce the concept of radical evil in 1790. So here you have the kind of the, uh, the frame of you know, likeness to, to Kant. This is really the time frame that I want to talk about. <coughs> And uh, the notion of radical evil uh, presents really a crucial point in the development of philosophical discussions about freedom and evil. Here, quote, Kant typically finds a positive construction to place on evil. Evil ultimately plays a role in the production of good. And the quote is more than Michelson determines. In other words, Kant sees evil in dutiful servitude, which, which advances goodness and progress. Thus, for Kant, evil is very much part of the actuality of the world as well as of God's absoluteness. This, however, changes with the concept of radical evil, which frees evil from its opposition to that which is good. Kant rethinks evil as it arises out of choices made, choices that are based on rationality or free choices. A good choice for Kant is a choice that pursues rational good, good goals. Hence, the universal can prevail over the particular. Still, Kant's earlier position on freedom, as well as his notion of radical evil, demonstrates his desire to, even if not always successfully, ground evil and freedom in rationality. I'm not sure how much you're all familiar, but we were talking about the pre-critical Kant, and then he published uh, the free, three critiques. Um, and uh, the, during this time, um, <coughs> he uh, developed this concept of radical evil. 
Um, and <clears throat> Kant, I think, is such an important figure here because the pretty critical Kant very much still operates in the Leibnizian own notion of freedom, uh, but then uh, really changes uh, the discussion and um, the <clears throat> uh, opens uh, then uh, the discussions on, on freedom and evil uh, for the 19th century. But that, that's, that's really a different discussion. <clears throat> Kant's introduction of radical evil presents, presents freedom and evil as a prosperity in human beings. Evil is thus what humans have to deny uh, are and are in fact capable of denying due to their inherent freedom. At the beginning of the 19th century, it provoked Schelling and others to refute this Kantian notion of freedom. Yet, to describe the development of the philosophical discussion about freedom in the above way misses completely that before Schelling and Fichte and others, Lessing had his own very unique point of view on the matter. But Lessing died before Kant published his first critique, 1781, and uh, Religion Within the Boundaries of Pure Reason, 1793, both of which form the philosophical basis uh, for radical evil. Now, what is remarkable is that Lessing not only presents a counter-argument to Kant's pre-critical notion of evil, but he anticipates Kant's move in his rejection of rationality as the highest principle. So now a little bit about, uh, about Lessing. Uh, Lessing may be seen as the writer of the German Enlightenment. At least he was considered as such by his contemporaries, and interestingly, uh, both his supporters and his opponents. Um, as a journalist, writer, philosopher, dramaturg, and librarian, there are few genres he did not employ in his writing. Drama, poetry, literary criticism, essayistic writings, theory, as well as extensive comments on art and aesthetics. He's known to have established the German domestic tragedy, Bürgerliches <clears throat> Trauerspiel. For our discussion today, it is important to point out that in almost all of his 14 plays, his view on freedom appears to be the obstruction of practical freedom. Typically, a member of the nobility prevents members of the middle class from acting freely. As ordinary citizens, they are forced to choose between good and evil, often presented on the stage as a binary choice. In the play Emilia Galotti, for example, a noble prince who wishes to seduce the young, beautiful Emilia, beleaguers her to the extent that she supplicates her father to kill her and thus save her from the lecherous advances of the prince. The choice here is not between freedom and servitude, but between different degrees of restrictions. Emilia chooses to die in order to be less limited and to resist, even only to a small extent, the power of the prince. For, e for lesson, evil is neither the result of nor a necessity for freedom. And it's, uh, the, the figure of the prince is actually quite interesting. He is not presented as this evil person who who's randomly exercises his, uh, his power and, and uh, exercises freedom. Um, he's more, more so driven by desires and necessity. However, in his tragedies, Lessing was more concerned with compassion and human action rather than with the problem of freedom and the evil. Moral decisions and even ethical judgments seem to be of lesser importance. In fact, Lessing saw compassion itself as a moral quality that needed to be developed individually. He showed little concern with the question of, the question of whether a decision or action was morally good. Rather, he was pondering decisions human beings make emotionally and the effect that these, these decisions have on others. But besides theater, his most defining writings concerned the philosophy of religion. More importantly, for Lessing than unrestricted human activity was the pursuit of truths. Truth stems from God. Therefore, truth is what human beings must strive for. And seeking truth is seeking goodness. It is for this reason that Lessing in 1774 published a series of fragments by Hamburg Orientalist Hermann Samuel Reimarus. The so-called Ramaros fragments questions the divine origin of the gospel. And Lessing had hoped that the release of the Ramaros uh, deliberation 
would generate a dialogue about history, reason, and God's revelation of the world. But Lessing infuriated the German Lutheran orthodoxy with his publication. Yet it was not the controversial content of the fragments that angered clergymen and theologians alike, but the very fact that Lessing was a layman in religious matters, and that he published them with a popular philosophical uh, <coughs> commentary, rather than uh, a religious uh, or theological dogma, which would have been appropriate for the time. The ensuing controversy became a disaster for Lessing. Instead of a public debate concerning the truths of the Bible, Lessing was personally attacked and had to defend the publication. It became so heated that in 1777, Lessing's employer, the Duke Carl I of Braunschweig, Walter Goodluck, personally instructed him to refrain from publishing on religious top topics. <clears throat> it's very typical for Lessing to <gasps> first ignore that order <laughs> and uh, publish two more uh, texts uh, anonymously. Um, and then it's also telling that uh, after that he starts, uh, stopped um, publishing on religious matters, other who had access to his writing uh, published his, uh, continued to publish his writing. But at that point, Lessing turned to theater to present another example for his thoughts on truth and goodness. Truth, and thus also goodness, can never be fully obtained, owned, or understood. In his last place, Nathan the Wise, 1780. His last play uh, uh, takes place during the Third Crusade in Jerusalem. The highly educated Jew, Nathan, raises a Christian foster daughter with the help of a Christian maidservant. Center to the play is a parable that Nathan relates to the Muslim Sultan Saladin. That's, that's the famous historical Saladin. Saladin cleverly poses an impossible question about the one true religion, Islam. Judaism or Christianity, in order to extort money from Nathan. The question is obviously a trap because Saladin would be offended if Nathan chooses Judaism, his own religion, over Islam. Nathan would not dare to propose Christianity because it represents the religion of Saladin's enemies. Thus, Islam is the only possible answer, which would betray Nathan's conviction and also would force him to financially support Saladin's war efforts. In order to avoid the predicament, Nathan presents the so-called parable of the rings to Saladin. So here in the play, we have another story. It's, it's uh, kind of phrased as, as a fairy tale. The father once owns a ring that possesses the power to make its owner, quote, likable to God and human beings. And hence brings continuous financial success. Because of, but because of his undivided love for his three sons, he arranges for two additional rings to be made, completely identical to the first. After the father's death, the sons, unable to distinguish the original from the two copies, call on a judge to resolve the inheritance dispute. Yet the judge refuses to make a decision and defers to a wiser judge at a later point in time. Quote, Thus I summon in a thousand thousand years the children's children's children of the three sons to stand before this bench. For then a wiser man than I will sit on this bench and pronounce the judgment. The implication is that the one true religion cannot be judged by its current appearance rendering Saladin's question invalid. More importantly, the judgment is deferred. For Lessing, no one can hold the truth. Truths can only be pursued. The question Saladin posed uh, to Nathan is an example of the problem of limited choices. To pursue other ends ahead of the truth results in limitations, restrictions, and inactivity. Saladin is not presented as a seeker of truth. It is his motivation, extorting money from Nathan, that renders his question insidious and sinister. Saladin's trickery also precludes Nathan from answering the question freely and truthfully. Lessing's notion of evil is not dependent on freedom. I hope this is uh, by now already clear. Evil stems from human error, from existing 
exercising power, offering limited choices, or seeking other ends while disregarding truths. Evil is simply an inevitable way to will. While at the same time God did not will evil deliberately, implying that evil has always existed independently of God's creation. He then simply presents the problem as a predicament. Either God willed good, and with it also evil, or if he did not will evil, we cannot know whether he even willed good. In an almost trivial question to the reader, Blessing asks, quote, what does my reader say? Do we want to keep both dilemmas or reject them? I am committed to the late letter. End of quote. So again, you know, he proposes a dualistic question, but then he rejects the entire question. He, he, he re rejects the entire approach. The statement is typical for Lessing since his only question presents the problem as a binary choice, and per, thus, per definition, as a limited choice. And already in 1751, so you know, 20 years, 25 years earlier, Lessing declares polemically, Malevolence cho chose God for the world as a filling, but not as its essence in the poem. Uh, that's actually a poem, so in German it rhymes beautifully, but um, yeah, there's, there's an ironic twist to it in German, but you cannot capture it in English, unfortunately. Well, we could simply end here. Lessing poses that evil, evil exists, but that it is impossible to answer why. We may furthermore declare that Lessing's interest in freedom or <clears throat> was limited to, to, to practical freedom in social and political context, but that he was by no means interested in the philosophical problem of human free will. His standing as a serious philosopher of the Enlightenment must then be called into question, and rightly so, as many have done. However, Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, in 1785, four years after Lessing's death, suggests that Lessing indeed thought a great deal about the problem, proclaiming <coughs> that Lessing had its own unique opinion on that. Jacobi visited Lessing twice in 1780 and subsequently published his account. And I think we need to take this report by Jacobi seriously, for it aligns well with, sorry, mixed up. So, and subsequently published his account uh, of their conversation, now known as the Spinoza Conversation. The, it's a central core as a discussion about uh, Spinoza's um, system. The publication caused another heated debate, this time with Lessing's legacy on the line. It is interesting how many controversy Lessing created during his lifetime that it didn't stop with his, uh, with his death. Um, there was one more uh, major debate, which identically is also the last major debate of the German Enlightenment, and it's often considered to be the end of the uh, German Enlightenment. The reason at the beginning for the new dispute was that Kobe's claim that Lessing was sympathetic to Spinoza. More specific, specifically, Jacobi, quote, explicitly equated Spinozism with atheism, thereby implicitly branding Lessing as a covert blasphemer. Kububa uh, Nisbet uh, explains, and thus confirming the worst suspicions of Lessing's theological enemies, namely Lessing's opponent during the Rhinos controversy. While it is unclear whether Jacobi's report represents more than anything his own rather than Lessing's ideas, it was certainly not helpful that Lessing wrote on a wall what Lessing wrote on a wall paper also in 1780. He and Jacobi visited uh, their mutual friend, Johann Wilhelm Ludwig Klein, who allowed visitors to write inscriptions on the wallpaper of one of his rooms. He was famous for this, and in 1750, uh, 1785, Johann Gottfried Herder confirmed that Lessing wrote Hen Kai Pan on that uh, wallpaper. And this is a Spinoza inspired motto that means all in one. And Jacobi did not fail to mention this inscription in his reports. Together with his own attack, with Jacobi's own attacks on philosophical positions of that time, and on the theological doctrine as well as Lessig's supposed rejection of pure rationality, it became what is now known the pantheism controversy, mm -hmm. controversy the last major dispute of the German election, as I've already said. 
In his report, Jacobi claimed that Lessing refuted the idea of free will. During one of their conversations on Spinoza, Lessing supposedly said to Jacobi, quote, I recognize you would prefer your will free. I desire no free will. And at the core, it is now my opinion that this statement is most of all Lessing's refusal to accept the notion of freedom as understood by his contemporaries. This becomes clear when looking at an earlier report by Jacobi, 1782, that never truly caught any attention. In this I heard Lessing say, Jacobi recounts, quote, free in the highest degree would be he who is determined in his actions by himself alone. Consequently, he who himself immediately brought all his objects into being, which can be said of no creature conscious of itself only by means of representations and striving after objects which are not in his power. God alone is free in this absolute sense. But free in his fashion, to the very highest degree, is every person and every citizen insofar as he is not prevented from furthering his own true advantage in every way in his power. End of quote. It's a long quote, let's unpack this a little bit. If Lessing, in fact, said this to Jacobi, we need to emphasize that Lessing here places freedom in the absolute, in accordance with individual human disposition, in his fashion. It is not freedom that may be limited, but the ways to advance as a human being in every way. This distinction between ways to advance and limitation of advancement appears minor because it still results in limited in limitation of freedom. But there is another aspect that Jacobi stresses here. Freedom for human beings means being allowed to advance in every way, which implies there are multiple ways to pursue truth. These include practical freedom in private and public manners, as well as general free will, which would include a free choice between good and evil actions. But this is never the case because human activity is always dependent on the consequences resulting from that very activity, and also because humans are bound by necessity. Since human activity in this way is always restricted, any notion of human freedom becomes irrelevant. In other words, Jacobi's use of the term free is misleading here. Lessing wants to underscore the restrictive nature of human existence in general and the advancement of the human race specifically. He concludes still in Jacobi's words, I desire no free will, for freedom does not free human beings from their particular existence. I think we need to, there, there's, a, there's a big discussion and uh, it has not been settled up, whether the Jacob, uh, reports that uh, Jacobi published, whether there really are truthful accounts of their conversations. But I think we need to take this uh, very seriously by Jacobi, uh, since it lines well with other statements by Lessing. For Lessing does not, uh, for Lessing does indeed address the question of the discrepancy between, God, between God's pure goodness and the world he created. The very fact of the creation is for Lessing proof of God's very goodness and omnipotence. But Lessing insists that the pure and good origin of nature lies entirely outside of the world and therefore also outside of human experience. This stands in direct opposite to Leibniz's worldly idea of the best of all possible worlds. For Lessing, godly perfection cannot be fully recognized due to its extra mundane situation. Neither God nor his creation can be grasped fully by human beings, since both are not comprehensible to human beings. The discrepancy of good origin of creation and the creation's worldly appearance must then appear as evil to human beings. The appearance of God, for example, through revelations, in the world is distinctly different from God and his actions. Reason and the propensity to seek truths compel human beings to assume a, godly, a good and godly origin. From this it follows that the 
preferency between God as absolute and the actuality of the world will and must inevitably be perceived as evil, but is not evil itself. Thus, evil does not ensue from a world that is not perfect, but stems from the problem that an absolute can in no possible way be thought of without contradictions. Therefore, humanity should not and cannot seek a pure and good absolute, which on earth would never be possible. Evil then is completely separated from God in the absolute. It is a result of human errors only. Lessing demands to recognize and understand, understand God only as he reveals himself to human beings throughout history, because human beings are merely capable of thinking about God in his worldly appearances and developments. Lessing says, quote, however I try to explain the reality of things outside of God, I have to confess that I can form no concept of it. If so, then evil must necessarily be part of the actual and changing manifestation of God, but not of God. Since any worldly appearance inevitably includes the discrepancy between God's existence in the absolute and his appearance in that which appears in actuality to human beings. Any deliberations about God's absoluteness and the creation must result in mystical speculation. And this is a notion that Kant would reject wholeheartedly. As we've already seen, Kant employs evil as an obedient servant in the name of goodness and progress. For Kant, evil must be very much part of the actuality of the world as well as of God's absoluteness. Freedom and the autonomy of reason must be the highest principles and highest goals of human thought. Freedom must be assumed if moral activity is to have any meaning for human beings. Freedom is the cause for evil, but freedom is at the same time the basic requirement of rationality, which in turn prevents evil, since rationality, that is, since irrational, that is a free being, will not act against reason. It should be noted that, in addition, that Lessing seems to be fully aware of the course Kant would eventually pursue in the 1780s and 1790s. But he objected to the subduing nature of rationality that governs all. For Lessing, the compassionate pursuit of truths stands above all. It enables one to act. Hannah Arendt calls Lessing's notion of freedom the freedom of movement, which she defines specifically in connection of thought to thought and action. Quote, and if for Lessing, a secret link between action and thought did exist, the link consisted in the fact that both action and thought occur in the form of movement and that, therefore, freedom underlies both freedom of movement and thought. But only among friends one can truly and freely act. And it's interesting, at the end of the parable of the ring, when Saladin comes to realize that he proposed a, a, <coughs> an impossible question, Saladin sends him away, accepts uh, the rejection of the question. He sends him away with the words, go away, go away, but please be my friend. For Kant, human freedom cannot be sacrificed for anything. Arendt, Arendt, and Arendt even calls this the inhumanity of Kant's moral philosophy. Kant would certainly be, have been prepared to sacrifice the true the truth <coughs> uh, to to the possibility of freedom. And <clears throat> thank you very much. That's, that's, my, that's my closing statement. I'm, I'm a little bit under the weather, so, so I'm happy for it. <laughs>
No, I don't. I don't think so. Um, but what I think what the problem really is is that that Lessing seriously raises the question: Should we even start with the assumption that freedom exists? Should we uh, start with the assumption that God willed freedom? Um, and uh, <clears throat> there, there are very, very few philosophers at that time that, that really point, point that out. Um, and it's interesting, so Hada, uh, you know, most of my work is really on, on Hada, but Hada is another one who, who does not really fully support the idea of, uh, of human free will as, as a given, as a proposition to start out with. And it is interesting that you know, the, the, at the end of the 18th century, and the beginning of the 19th century, that those writers who raised that question, the very question, does freedom exist, are, were at the time uh, rejected as philosophers and are now not part of the uh, philosophical discussions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Kant is, is, is uh, uh, certainly part of every undergraduate philosophy <laughs> curriculum. Um, and I'm not necessarily proposing that Lessing should be. Um, I, don't, I don't think that his, his contributions to uh, philosophy in general are, uh, are important enough. Uh, but for example, he's also not taught in, uh, in theology, for example. And I think he plays a huge role uh, in theology, but he's not taken seriously as a uh, thinker, as a philosopher. Well, I think the, the, the problem of the existence of, of evils is fundamental, both to philosophy as well as clearly to theology. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a, a good God who is all powerful, all knowing, uh, then how do, how do we explain evil? Right. Just as a sidebar, uh, a few, many years ago, I looked into this with Augustine, and he attempted to explain evil as the residue of the nothingness. Right. From creation out of out of nothing, which is sort of sort of an interesting move. Mm -hmm. But if we go back then to the German Enlightenment and thinking, let's say, of Kant, and, but also thinking a little bit further on into German philosophy, mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that there's a there's a conceptual problem there, given that. All of these thinkers, in some way or another, want to recognize the fundamental importance, certainly Kant does, the necessity of, of freedom to morality, to choice, to human beings, being the distinctive creatures we are. Uh, and this, of course, gets us caught up in the distinction between the phenomenal and the noumenal, and well, in all those dimensions, and so on and so forth. But how then? If, if we follow the moral law, let me take Kant for example. So we end up, it seems to me, with, with a kind of a paradox, that freedom consists in my submitting to the authority of, of the moral law, to the, to the authority of reason. Uh, so if, if we try to confront that, and I'm just moving very fast here, don't we then end up with the will, the will as the will, with Nietzsche, mm -hmm. where the will is willing itself. Uh, because then you don't have to, you seemingly eliminate the problem of something else determining the will, or the will submitting and thus surrendering its freedom. Mm -hmm. But then if you end up with the will willing itself, then don't we have nihilism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the, step in, the step in between is Shelley here, you know, who, who uh, I think um, um, formulated this this very notion that the will will itself into existence, mm -hmm. um, and with and then Schelling adds the multiplicity, right? So the will uh, is is a singular, at, you know, at, at its origin, but then it wills itself into existence, and by willing itself into existence, it creates uh, plurality, and with plurality. Evil arises, uh, and yes, absolutely. It, it, and I think what I'm I'm hoping what we see in, in my presentation of Lessing is I think it's really really unfortunate that nobody paid attention to 
to lessons, um, uh, at least you know, questioning the whole idea of that, that, that will, some way or another, is part of God's creation. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to jump in on this question of evil too. Because I remember towards the beginning you said that uh, I think it was Nelson you were talking about that good is the kind of state of existence, and then, or and then the evil is nothingness. Well, that's that's lightness, yeah. Oh yeah, so that was so that was back further right. than, than last week. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's an interesting like I wonder what that um, development from like from that place where you can get to something like Heidegger's being thrown and this, you know, like the idea of nothingness. It, what, it, it raises this question too of then, well, what is evil? And is it really that space of just the nothing? And like that, that to me seems like I'm not sure how that fits into some of the other work that you've been talking mm -hmm. about. But I was wondering if you could just say a little bit. Yeah, no, I think I, I, that belongs to, to this, this discussion. Um, so uh, to back up a little bit, so um, Lessing very much studied Leibniz. And uh, in, in the 1750s, um, when you look at uh, the few comments uh, Lessing made uh, on, on, on evil, uh, he seems very much um, a Leibnizian uh, thinker. Um, <clears throat> but then in the, in the 1770s and then you know, early, early 80s, you know, Kant has already proposed his, uh, you know, his uh, his uh, early thoughts, um, and I think Lessing takes takes note. And I th one of the things that Lessing doesn't address, but maybe does not want to address, is, is the question that you're you're asking: How do you get from nothing to something? And uh, you know, you could, you might be able to criticize Lessing for not having thought about it, but he, he basically moves it into the abstract, and he says. We have no way of accessing, of access to that kind of information, and that he calls it mysticism. Uh, so, so it's kind of interesting that he, uh, you know, he is in his later writing, he's somewhat considered anti-rational, particularly anti this pure rationality that that kind of, uh, displays, but um, that. He also rejects the mysticism that then Schelling, uh, you know, uh, employs for his, you know, the will willed itself into existence. What does that mean? <laughs> um, is this difference between nothingness and uh, and things that exist based on the notion uh, that some things have purpose? Some ideas have grounded purpose and obvious purpose in the world, and some. And some don't, and it's just sort of it's just sort of rolling thought, if that makes sense. Uh, very, very much so. That I mean, we. Have, I mean, I thought. Have, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, thought, I thought the term purpose came up in the discussion. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. No, I think you're you're right. The the problem obviously is like let's quickly consider it also the alternative. There there is no free will, right? If we look at it from a scientific point of view, that we're only you know, uh, an accumulation of, of molecules, right? And, and that these molecules are essentially the same. Then we have to reject individuality, right? Um, and with that, we have to reject purpose. And then, uh, aren't we back to, to nihilism? Again? <laughs> mm -hmm. right. How do so, we keep coming back here? Sorry? How do we keep coming back to that? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it seems like maybe with nothingness we're talking about we're talking about any notion that doesn't immediately answer itself, right? That that demands that you sit there and ponder, right? And it doesn't it doesn't have a uh, an a, an how do I want to say this? It doesn't translate immediately into an action. I I don't know. I feel I I feel like maybe that's the difference between the something and nothingness. But. Yeah. Yes. But um, you know that, that Kant would reject it, and Hegel particularly. Uh, you can probably talk more about that. But, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the whole idea that nothingness cannot be observed, but the mm -hmm. effect of nothing, nothingness can be observed. Um, and you know, you see, uh, <clears throat> you see this somewhat alluded to already in Leibniz that that uh, because uh, human beings recognize that there is a lack uh, or a deficiency, 
and maybe also recognize that there is uh, you know, something that has no uh, reason for existence, right? Um, that that compels human beings to counter what you then can call. So it's still human. associated with an a it's still associated with an action, but you may have like a, a lack of purpose or a, yeah. uh, okay, that makes sense. Well, there's the trilemma that Gorgias put mm -hmm. forth, right? Nothing exists. If it exists, it can't be known. If it can be known, it can be communicated. Okay. It's just, and so much has come out of that. But you know, this thing about evil, a little humor here. Mm -hmm. Before I was one year old, I was baptized. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I had a godfather, yeah. a goddess mother, and so on, and no evil at all. Make of it whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what I want to come back to lessing is if 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 you recognize the dilemma, why get caught up in the dilemma? Why not develop a different approach to it? And I think that's that's where lessing's moral philosophy. Um, that does exist, um, however, you know, dispersed it is throughout his writings. That's the difficulty with Lessing. Um, that uh, besides his uh, writings on the, uh, philosophy of religion, there is no central philosophical text. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's all over the place, and it's in his in his plays, and you know, it's in, in his fables. He loved fables. He wrote fables um, uh, and, and wrote comments on on ancient fables. So. You know, you have to sift through all of that. Um, but in his in his moral philosophy, he says, I'm really not interested in interested in that question. What I'm more interested in is 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 how does you know, despite the fact that you know, in, in light of nothingness or whatnot, human beings still act. We're we're not. We're not going, uh, you know, Dostoevsky, the underground man, right? <laughs> who, uh, who, you know, who thinks about every action and the result, and the, the, you know, how how the, the, his action could result in evil action, right? And despite that, we're we're acting human beings. We're thinking and acting human beings. So he is interested. He's much more interested in in why do we act, and he feels that rationality when it is important, doesn't play a role in decision making, but it is compassion. And, and then you, when you look at that, you're so far out, uh, you know, away from the realm of, of rational philosophy of, of Kant and whatnot. Kant rejects all of that. And so I'm wondering what role then, uh, in that, the idea that we do act, right? And so we have these systems, the idea of the lack, nothingness and all of that. What role does the symbolic order then play in some of that? And does that does that get picked up in some of these threads, or is that much later, or a totally different school of thought? But if, you know, to a certain extent, we still have you know, if we're thinking about people. It is first, or maybe first, or maybe second, a word. And does that you know, maybe does it proceed? That maybe that's a question. Does it proceed or or follow the actual action of people? And so this idea that. Regardless of these things, we're still acting and thinking human. But then what role does the symbolic order come into play? Mm. I, I think I would have to go back to her. Or her. Um, um, because he, he, I don't, I can't think of maybe in his fables, uh, as he does talk about that. Um, but so Hara, by the way, Hara is a student of Kant, so he, he fits into this. And then in the uh, 1790s, uh, he gets into a huge fight after the publication of the first critique. Uh, Hara completely rejects it, and uh, Kant uh, trashes Hara's monumental um, uh, philosophy of history. But uh, for Hara, this the symbolic order is represented in nature. And, um, and he has this dynamic or organic idea of how, how everything uh, um, 
is linked together. Right? Cause and effect is, is extremely important for him. Right? So while he doesn't specifically talk about the symbolic order, uh, I, I do see <coughs> that 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 the visual, the the, the uh, like a like a visual ordering of nature with um, interestingly. Uh, the human being at the center, not on top, but in the center, um, is for for uh, Hala something that is uh, that is important. Um, and he would he would say uh, again. I think that's uh, it's it's a similar argument to Lessing. He says uh, we are at the center of the creation, but not because everything God it made everything for us, but because we have no other point of view outside of ourselves. I don't think it really answers the question, but... My first reaction is that this whole redoubling of this view, like, when I, the moment I say I desire free will, it's kind of a Hamasian approach, you already have a kind of a free willing thought for me to say that I don't have a free will. Like, this negation itself assumes mm -hmm. that I have a certain kind of a neutral position to say I have no free will. Mm -hmm. So it's like a transcendental turn around, like, my question is, this is kind of a Freudian question as well. Like, if I have no free will, why do I pronounce it? Like, I don't have free will, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, uh, I, I don't know much about Lessing or her, but it, it resonated much with Kierkegaard as well. For an example, for, for Kierkegaard, I, I, even I would agree with him, like, I also absolutely feel if I had no free will, I would have much like it. Like, even if I was not born or if I, had, if I hadn't, any free will, I would have much liked it. But the point is like what Kierkegaard would have called the sanctioning of the eternal. Like we are not simply as such without any free will. Like we are sanctioned all the time, you know, in, in daily life. So this is the problem. Like it's not like we. What makes it redouble it? Like pronounce, I have no free will, or uh, like all these kind of appear. Like you know, he gave in terms like appearance of the appearance. Why the question of appearance? So, and even as you said, like for Shelley, Shelley would have thought like the uh, submitting myself to a kind of a higher view. So that's first my first question. Like, if I have no free will, why do you have to say that I don't have free will? Like, kind of work. And then you said about the freedom, question of freedom. Mm -hmm. The way, the, the reason I think that there is kind of I, mean, I don't know, but some kind of difference would be if you associate freedom with an openness as you said, freedom of choice or something, then we get caught for this kind of, uh, uh, there is no freedom. But as you said, from Fitch's day on Shelley, the, 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 the continuing question was limitation, like how to limit subjectivity from Fitch's day, then Shelley and Hegel and all that. So, in, term, uh, in psychoanalytic terms, desire is a decision, of course, it's a decision, but as for as it is for Shelley and in psychoanalytic term which we call the drive, it's not simply a decision that I desire my something. I find myself already deciding. This is the Shellingian position as well. Like if I fall in love or something, I don't decide, oh you have this thing, you have this thing, you have this thing, so therefore I decide. That's not even in true faith, like to Kekikai. Faith is not that I have the reasons why the God exists, therefore I decide to believe. I, I already believe and therefore I find the reasons why I should believe. I have to already be in belief. I have to already be in love to see why this person is perfect for me. So I find this limitation like among so many options, this person gets fixated. This is the, pro this is the problem. Like This is the free will kind of a problem that bothers me. It's easy to say there is no free will as such, scientific cause and law and all that. But why do we get fixated to one thing? Like freedom as a limitation. Like, Fix it. This is the yeah, question I have. Yes. So, um, I think uh, what's interesting, um, Lessing uses a lot of irony. And uh, although we don't know whether he really said it, or let's assume that Jacobi uh, uh, reports truthfully, he doesn't say, I do not have free will. He says, I desire no free will. Right? And, you know, desiring something is already willing something, right? So, so I, I'm very sure, you know, since he was such an ironic writer, um, he, he was very much aware of, uh, of, of the, the irony in that, that statement. Um, but 
to, to be uh, a little bit more serious about your first question, um, would it be really impossible that we deceive ourselves, that we are able to say, I have free will, I, I desire free will? That's, I mean, that would be my, my question. Would that, would that automatically assume that we do have free will? Even in an illusionary uh, situation. No, I mean, I follow Hegel here. I mean, there is no right. just principle. You cannot start with some proposition here and then build upon that. What I'm just simply saying is that, OK, uh, if you refer to uh, uh, science, like if you take a person like, I don't know, if you are Benjamin Libet and all that, like he did this experiment that he wired the person to brains and all that. And he met, like, he asked the person to build something. And he already detected the waves, uh, the what you call neuronal thing coming even before I decided to move my hand or not. But then he said the human thing is to basically sabotage this, this causality. Like the, 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 the stupidity or whatever the humanness is you have the cause in order and then you sabotage it. I mean, okay, like even in political terms, like things like suicide bombing, like suicidal and all these kind of gestures. I, we cannot start with saying that there is a free will, that this kind of pre Kantian, uh, what do you call this kind of naive realism kind of thing. We cannot, but my question is the question of limitation as free will. Like, why do we limit ourselves to particular objects in psychology terms or whatever, like the cause or love object or in terms of religion, faith, or if you go for art? If, you know, when an artist is into a certain thing, you, you like, the, the basic existential experience is not that I decide to do this or something. It's just like I feel like I'm onto something, I, nothing bothers me. I don't care about anything else. It's, this is just what matters to me. Even in science, you, 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 know, you can risk your life and all this. So my question is limitation. Why do we limit? Like, the plurality, plurality is a fact. Why do I, do I have a freedom or something, like right. freedom is limited, yeah. But do we, and I think what Lessing wants to point out here is, do we really need the discussion about the origin of freedom and the origin of evil in order to answer the question of limitations? I absolutely agree with you, you cannot, you cannot, I think that's Lessing's point. You cannot start with an assumption that contradicts itself at one point in the discussion, you know, the, 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 the dilemma uh, that you, you're going into, right? So the, then the question is, uh, you know, can we have a discussion about limitations, you know, make, I guess some examples, right? Practical limitations, uh, uh, without the notion of freedom, without the notion of evil. Well, you have, you have to have limitation and restriction because otherwise you have no choice. You're doing nothing. If you, if you say, if you don't limit yourself by saying, okay, I'm going to have a, a cup of coffee as opposed to a cup of tea, uh, then you, you ultimately end up in a complete state of inertia doing nothing at all. Well, so why is there a problem? I but understand what the problem with choice is. Yeah, but is it there in nature as such, in the ecosystem and the nature? Do we have this question of limitation, nature on its own limiting itself kind of thing? So does the question then become the origin of freedom, the origin of uh, choice and those things? Origin of evil, maybe the origin of origins, right? It's not necessarily the origin of where we would start limitations and restrictions, but whether we're going to have coffee or tea, but from whence do those things, to where are they situated? The origin of origins itself, right? That's, I think, maybe also something to think about. There were two. There were two um, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, okay, so my understanding is not as sophisticated as what's going on right here, but I, I'm really intrigued by this idea of the will building itself that we kind of start off with, which I guess kind of goes with what you're saying. So, like, uh, there's been a lot of talk in another class this week about whether we have sort of a visceral reaction and then we apply a, a rationale after the fact in order to make sense of what we initially did. Um, I guess what, what I'm curious about is, since we're considering notions of good and evil, and we're talking about what is actually causing us to make these decisions, if we take this sort of stance that we don't have any free will and everything's just a reaction from everything around us, or it was already predetermined, then do people actually have a responsibility when they make evil choices, or choices that we would constitute as a good evil? 
Oh, um, I'm I'm concentrating on the on the difference between the, the notions of free will and freedom, because the free will question. I mean, the whole problem is that it collapses on itself, right? And there's and there's a really wide based widely based agreement that it collapses on itself. So it seems like to say. I don't desire free will is a way to is a way to address that question in a new way and sort of move move away from that uh, well move away from that system where there is no freedom to even discuss it right and um, create more I don't know create more of an area to move around so I think in that sense the notion of freedom can be set aside from the notion of free will yeah. right and say hey if we if we stop staring at this problem that I said collapses on itself then maybe we actually can get back to the notion of freedom um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that what Lessing, Lessing does whenever he talks about freedom he really talks about practical freedoms right mm -hmm. you know the imposed limitations or you know you know limited choices free choices typically done by somebody in power right um, and then then when, when the, the, the few points where he actually talks about free will, he seems to talk about something completely different. And I, th I think you, you, you kind of summarized. You're, I mean, you're my, my also uh, exercising intellectual, like intellectual power over the idea, though. When when you say I'm going to like when I, when you say I'm going to take this leap of faith, or I'm going to establish this um, this conceit, mm -hmm. right? It says I don't need free will. Right, so I reject the notion of it altogether. Or I don't, I'm not saying it's not there, but I reject the need for it. Right, I think that opens up a whole new space for conversation. But in that context, what does it mean to say, I reject that notion? You're contradicting yourself. I mean, he's, I mean I, not I, you. I right. mean, but anybody who says that, I reject the notion of free will, well, yeah, that's the right. 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 That's um, As opposed to rejecting the existence of can, I, can I quickly respond to, to, because I think the notion of responsibility is important. So, so what we, we didn't get to is, the, for me, when I look at this, it becomes interesting. Let's, let's take God out of the equation, right, you know, and put it into, you know, our current situation. Uh, where, you know, the creation of the world and, you know, these kind of things are not, not as pressing, uh, at least for some of us. Um, but I think the, we're still built on this system. Uh, I mentioned it in the beginning, and Hannah Arendt is very, very much concerned with that. Is, is if we take this notion there is freedom, right, as an absolute, we don't discuss it. Right? Our whole legal system is built on it. Right? Our our whole system of punishment is is built on it. Right? And that's why we have difficulties with uh, with crimes uh, committed by people who were acting under influence or are you know, considered not uh, fully aware of themselves or, or what they are doing. Um, and in, in, in public debates, I kind of miss that debate where we ask, can we, can we really start with the notion of human freedom exists? And, and you know, I know in, in philosophical circles, you know, this, this, this question is discussed, but um, so, and I think what's interesting for Lessing is that he brings the notion of compassion. Right? Um, and for Lessing, compassion is responsibility. Uh, and that's why he likes the theater. He, he displays uh, an atrocious act on the stage. And we, we're, as the audience, we look at this and we are feeling with the victim on the stage. And that, uh, you know, uh, uh, and therefore, lesson then means that's catharsis for lesson. That makes me as as a uh, as a spectator better. Later in the 20th century, Brest comes and he says that's all you know that all doesn't work, but that's a different story. But we have to recall that our parents, Adam and Eve, <laughs> yes. sinned, and it's a fortunate fall that the gates of heaven are open now. So out of evil comes good. That's <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs>